testing times. Roy and special guests join a Hampshire partridge shoot on the first day of their season with a very different safety briefing. No touching. I've written no touching, so I'll say it. No touching. <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to touch. You're the same bubble. Really? <laughs> Plus, there's a chance to win a peg on a bigger day on the Steventon shoot. Silence, please. We announce your top choices for rifle moderators. Eco a go go. We take a sneak peek at what this month's field tester has to offer. It was the equinox last night, so let's talk night vision. I speak to Foxing Kit reviewer Mike Powell. And suffering seagulls, Natural England says they're under threat. Seafront shop owners say rubbish. They are under attack. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Shooting is always under scrutiny, so when there's a change in the rules for the rest of society, we must toe the line and hang bells and whistles on it for good measure. It's going to be fascinating to see what goes into making today's partridge shoot in Hampshire doable, workable and responsible. Is that a homemade mask? Yes. Is that your curtains in the front room? <laughs> It's the first day of this shoot's season and Roy is joining a fine team of guns from magazine editors to Olympic medalists and sporting agents. No touching. I've written no touching, so I'll say it. No touching. <laughs> right, Roy and Becky. <laughs> You're allowed to touch. You're the same bubble. Really? <laughs> They're all guests of Keith Gorsuch. He runs the Steventon and Farley Wallop shoots. Getting to this point has taken a huge amount of effort. Today's our first day through, hopefully that won't be too apparent, but to, to make it all happen we've had uh, forms that need to go out to the guns before they come. Um, that was really it. impressive, that online system last night was really good, is that something that's unique to yourselves? Uh, yes indeed, Sue's uh, has pulled that one together for us. There are various uh, health questions within that uh, document, standard questions really but pulled together in a format that allows us to assess hazard it's for everybody's safety, yeah. The beaters and pickers up are in bubbles of six. There's hand sanitizer everywhere. And if you want the salt at lunch, under restaurant rules, you'll have to shout. This is the distance people tend to keep away from anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Our first drive and Roy is using some new kit. He has Beretta's new Silver Pigeon, the Beretta Silver Pigeon 3. Launched just a few weeks ago, it's the game version of the well-known Silver Pigeon shotgun. Plus, we have a few boxes of Game Boards, bio wad steel shells left over from a field tester Eco Shell Day. You lined up Steve Scott Olympian. How do you feel about that? Yeah. A bit rusty? Very rusty. No, I don't, I, yeah, I've, um, I've seen Steve shoot a few times and um, yeah, I, all I can say is I'm just pleased I'm not on the peg next to him because he would uh, be wiping... Patrick Albrey. I know, God, yeah, poor old Patrick's next to him, thank all God. He does his shoot. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank God I wasn't next to Steve. I've got, yeah, Connor's here as well. He's a, a fantastic shot and a lot of the guys here are very, very good shots. So, yeah, I'm, um, I'm just going to stay really, really quiet and um, hopefully I won't have to raise the gun too much. That's the better one. First day for you? I was actually in Suffolk wildfowling last weekend, or that was the plan anyway. Okay, but. how'd you get on there? Uh, well, the only thing which I shot was a snipe. So right. It was one for one. And okay. It was, um, <laughs> well, keep, if you can keep that average today, no, you'll be doing I mean, well. Yeah, well, I've already let myself down. That's fine. It was the, <laughs> possibly the smallest snipe I think I've ever shot. I oh, really? felt bad about it, but I went home the next day and ate it with some um, scrambled eggs. Did it eat well, though? Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah. It's always, I think, almost the smaller it is, the more you appreciate it. <laughs> Sliced it up on top of some scrambled eggs. <laughs> so. That's your story for life. <laughs> The first drive is a warm-up. The others prove to be the drives that just keep on giving. The birds continue to rocket over the guns for at least 20 minutes apiece. Shot.
second drive is definitely uh, proving to be a little busier. We've got, uh, and the, the birds are presenting really well actually. There we go. So, uh, yeah, no, there's some crackers coming through here. <laughs> now, Roy, do you want to take the other one? Because <laughs> I can't do I was, we, were, we, were, we were saying you were skilled. At 11s is we catch up with Olympic double track bronze medalist Steve Scott, who is now turning his hand to gamekeeping on Keith's Farley Wallop Shoot. So I've been working with Keith now for about four months since coming off the funding programme. Um, so I've been here sort of helping out the keepers, getting the pens sorted and getting all the feeders out and stuff like that. So learning a new, uh, a new um, way of life really. Uh, it's been really interesting, it's nice working outside as well and seeing how obviously I've shot game now for about six, seven years and it's nice seeing how it all works and seeing what they go through and the hard work they put in to produce a good day for the guns. All oh, right, so you didn't come from game then, you, you, were, you were competitive all yep. the way through and then found game? Yes, yes, exactly. So I started at the age of nine shooting clays. Um, I've done a little bit of rough shooting to be fair, so I've done um, your pigeon shooting, um, rabbit shooting, stuff like that. But um, no, I worked my way into game about six years ago when I was very luckily invited. Um, to come game shooting by Mr. Gorsuch actually. Uh, and uh, yeah, have a look back. You got some great birds on that last drive. I was a little bit lucky on the last drive. No, yeah, I think I think a few of them flew into my lead. Frickly, yeah. <laughs> bronze medalist. I did pace one out about 75 yards. I was quite happy with that one. That was the long one. And Keith was standing behind me. I can't repeat the words he said, but it was a few, <laughs> it's very rare to hear him swear and be impressed in the same sentence. So um, yeah, that gave me a bit of pleasure to uh, hear him say that and uh, pull down quite a long target. That was a better bird there are four there. drives today, two before a break, one before lunch and one after lunch. Everyone is getting some shooting and Roy is happy with the idea that he's not leaving Bastock on the field. We've just picked up a couple of wads here. So we've got, that is the, the bio wad, so that should dissolve and disappear very rapidly. And then we've got our normal traditional plastic wad, which unfortunately will stay around for a damn sight longer. Does it make you feel better walking off this field knowing that you're leaving stuff that will be gone in 24 hours? No, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know about feeling better. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's a responsibility now to make sure that we're not discarding plastics everywhere, that we're not, um, or, you know, we're, we're cutting down on, on the amount of lead that we're putting into, um, into the food chain. From my perspective, we can make the food that is going into the food chain more acceptable um, for a wider audience. And, and if, people, if that's what it's going to take to make people happier to, to eat more game, um, then I'm, I'm all for it. Roy and Bex have some young dogs with them today. He explains why it's best to avoid using pigeons to teach retrieving skills. We try to avoid picking up pigeons to start with because they're a lot looser feathered. So you can just see how easily the feathers are just coming out of my hand there. And that's exactly the same when a young dog picks it up. Those feathers will come out in the dog's mouth and they can just gum their mouth up a little bit, make them feel a little bit, I suppose, a bit down in the mouth. The partridges are not as, nowhere near as bad. I mean, you can see with the partridge, yeah, I mean, yeah, doing the same thing with the partridges, there's a few little bits, but they're a lot tighter feathered. The partridges are okay and pheasants are good, but as I say, it's the, the pigeons that are, are very, very soft. Like it is, it is, you know, you can just see them there, the feathers are just coming out as I'm handling it quite gently. At lunch we grab Patrick Galbraith, editor of Shooting Times, to talk about the new Silver Pigeon, an iconic shotgun that he is featuring in this week's issue. One of the amazing things with them is that people get one uh, as a sort of first gun or a first proper gun and they carry on shooting and shoot more and more and more and more and actually just carry on shooting with the Silver Pigeon because, you know, it fits well, it yep. sort of shoots well and just the reliability of them. I mean, I, uh, I won't mention the brand, but I changed to, a, to another make of gun after having my Silver Pigeon for a long time. It was only really at that point that I realised that guns do sort of stop working from time to time because I treated yeah. that Beretta pretty badly. And they, and yeah, they're just solid. It just works. Yeah, yeah. It just works. Don't reinvent the wheel is always a good thing in terms of gun making and yeah. Beretta have done something slightly different here, the forerun slightly different, but it's going to feel like um, you know, the gun that people have sort of you know, known and loved over the years. To me, they're, they're, it's very similar as, as starting off your rifle shooting career if you're using a, a Tika 
or a Seiko, you know, they're, they're a solid workhorse and they, they see you through, you know, they do last. It'll be interesting with the wood because one of the things with the older silver pigeons that the, uh, the quality of the wood was really quite good and then I think perhaps there was a little bit of a, and now they seem to be getting back there. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how it goes down with, uh, with silver pigeon enthusiasts. The final drive is a more gentle affair and finishes off the day well. You know, only a few months ago there was so much uncertainty and you know, to be out in the shooting field again has just been an absolute joy um, and a, a, a bit of an escape and a bit of a break from um, all of the, uh, the negativity that's surrounding COVID at the moment and, and again I mean we couldn't have been any safer out in the field today. Before heading back for a cuppa and a slice of cake we talked to Ollie Seven for a chat from the agency arm of William Powell. He has a countrywide overview of how well shoots are complying with COVID restrictions. The COVID situation is, is one we are in and it's one we all recognise that we're in and, and as a result the, the correct protocol and procedures have been used and put in place across all the moors, which is obviously imperative for, for the safety of the guns, pickers up, the beaters, everybody involved. We appreciate that it's we're incredibly fortunate to be out in the field uh, and people aren't taking it for granted and are, are really sort of um, taking note of of what we're saying and, and, and what we're asking for, which is fantastic and incredibly important. It's taken a great deal of work to create a shoot that observes social distancing while delivering a day to remember. We hope it will be a blueprint for us to present to shooters and non-shooters on how it should and is being done. For anyone interested in shooting at the Steventon or Farley shoots this season, go to sportinggameservices.co.uk. Thank you to all those involved in the Stephen and shoot. Looked like quite a day, which is something a lucky few of you may be able to experience. All you need to do is visit sportinggameservices.co.uk, add your details to the inquiry section, and you will be entered into a free draw to win a peg on a shoot day at either the Steventon or the Farley Wallop shoots sometime during the 2020-2021 season. There's also a second draw only for full teams taking a day on either of the shoots. One of them will receive an extra 50 birds on their shoot day. The shoot is collecting the names and the contact details. Both of these draws run until the end of 2020. Entries for the first draws by midnight on the 28th of September 2020, and I will make the draw on Field Sports Britain and announce the lucky winners next week. Right, from streaking partridges to, well, thank goodness he isn't, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Channel 4 has jumped on the anti-grouse shooting bandwagon with a report that could be considered contempt of court. The network's chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, doorsteps people on a shoot in Goatland, North Yorkshire, about an incident months ago involving an apparent killing of a goshawk by a gamekeeper. Police are investigating and the carcass of the bird has not been found. Thompson claims there's a catalogue of crime connected to shooting and insists the goshawk is the latest victim. Shooting Times writer Matt Cross is shocked that one of Channel 4's most senior reporters breaks so many basic rules of reporting. Yeah, and I was flabbergasted. I was like, you can't say that. Is he really on TV, on national TV, telling people that somebody has committed a crime when they haven't even been to court? That's, I mean, that's terrible and it's basic bad journalism. Scottish conservationists have recorded rare activity in hen harriers. A nest camera picked up a male hen harrier standing guard over a nest in the Langham area of southern Scotland and a hen harrier nest being predated on by owls. These pictures released by the Moorland Association show the owls attacking early one morning in spring. Before the owl attack, the female hen harrier spends eight days taking care of the five chicks, but a fox scares her away. A short-eared owl then checks out the chicks, which a long-eared owl kills. The mother returns and removes the remaining two dead chicks. The photos help show how hen harrier nests fail for a variety of reasons, including natural predation. SABs have released 20 contact details of badger cull contractors and threaten to release more. Anti-badger shooting group Stop the Cull says it's obtained names of contractors, including Field Sports Channel's Charlie Jacoby, and it's releasing 20 a day until the National Farmers Union takes down its badger cull reporting website. 
The group claims it successfully hacked the website and they have certainly logged on to Charlie's account, revealing that, not surprisingly, in four outings in 2017, he shot no badgers. It is more likely that the email addresses come from a leak. Former Metropolitan Police Detective Inspector Ian Jensen recommends that all named contractors report the incident to the Information Commissioner's Office. The only way you'd ever get to the bottom of that is by doing a, a, a doing a report to the Information Commissioner. You know, and I, I think Charlie and everybody on that list should do it and say, my data has not been kept safe, and that's a, that would elicit an investigation. Police chiefs are ignoring illegal fox hunting, according to a report by Antis. Action Against Fox Hunting says it compiled police responses to more than 80 incidents reported in the 2019-2020 hunting season, reports The Independent. The newspaper, which is fiercely anti-field sport, says the report by hunt saboteurs is the first on enforcement since the 2004 fox hunting ban. It accuses police officers of lacking training and not understanding the hunting ban. The sabs who blow whistles and spray citronella around to confuse hounds are also shocked that some officers support hunts and even go on them. Trail hunting is legal and enjoyed by hundreds of thousands of country people. A hunt saboteur has been convicted of using edited video to try and frame a farmer. David Graham was unanimously found guilty by a jury of perverting the course of justice by looping the footage to make it look like he was repeatedly kicked by the farmer. However, the jury at Leicester Crown Court acquitted Graham, a member of West Midlands Hunt Saboteurs, of making a false complaint of assault related to the same incident in March 2016. He denied both charges, insisting the video must have been edited by someone else before he downloaded it from the SAB Group's cloud storage. A woman has been arrested in connection with dog thefts in Bedfordshire. At the same time, police have released security camera images of suspects in the theft of eight dogs from kennels in Widden on September the 13th. A black Labrador, two Cocker Spaniels and five English Springer Spaniels were taken. The BBC says the dogs were worth about £50,000. The woman in her 20s is from the Dunstable area and was arrested on suspicion of burglary on Friday. Bedfordshire police say there's been a surge in puppy thefts since lockdown. Anyone with information about dog thefts should call Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Are you planning to buy a gun? Well, the Guns on Pegs Gun Makers Evening has moved online and it starts this evening. It'll see leading brands from the gun making world and beyond showcasing their craft via a short video specially made for the website showing off their products. Exhibitors already confirmed include Purdy, Browning and Longthorn, as well as Harkila, The Shooting Chauffeur and Holtz Auctioneers. WorldGunmakers.com will run for 12 months until the organisers hope they can run the real event again this time next year. I, like you no doubt, have greatly missed the events that have been cancelled due to Covid. There have been developments in the world of gun making and shooting that we haven't been able to see. Our aim is that this event goes a little way in filling that gap in our hobby. The Swiss will vote this weekend on whether to allow wolf hunting. The Federal Act on Hunting was created in 1986, when there were no wolves in Switzerland. Since then, wolves have returned, numbering 80 in 2019, and packs regularly kill and injure sheep and goats. Parliament has changed the rules to allow wolf hunting, but animal rights groups have called for a referendum against the proposal. The mystery behind hundreds of elephant deaths in Botswana in May and June has been solved. Wildlife officials say 330 elephants died after ingesting cyanobacteria. The findings follows months of tests in labs in South Africa, Canada, Zimbabwe and the US. Authorities initially doubted bacteria was to blame because algal blooms containing the bacteria are found on the edges of ponds, while elephants usually drink from the middle. The World Wildlife Fund estimates there are 415,000 African elephants, but lists the species as vulnerable because of the likelihood of human-elephant conflicts. Time is running out for the US to avoid a feral swine bomb. There are as many as 9 million feral swine across the country, according to the Undark magazine website. Their population is expanding from about 17 states to 38 over the past three decades. University of Saskatchewan researchers say wild pigs will occupy nearly 400,000 square miles by the end of 2020, at the current rate of 35,000 square miles a year. The hogs are a mix of domestic breeds and European wild boar, creating super pigs that breed all year and have large litters. They cause an estimated 2.5 billion US dollars worth of damage each year, from damaging crops and attacking livestock to destroying habitats. 
The researchers say efforts to deal with the pigs are only about 1% of what's needed. There are no figures for Canada, but in Saskatchewan, they say there will soon be more wild pigs than people. Americans are gearing up for this weekend's National Hunting and Fishing Day. Sportsmen and women from across the country will be celebrating the rich traditions of hunting, target shooting and fishing that pay for US wildlife habitats. Organisers say there will be events at national, state, regional and local levels. Launched in 1971 by Congress, the day recognises hunters and anglers as leaders in wildlife and conservation. And finally, pest controllers have shot a rather large fox on a golf course in South London. Ross Vanner sends in this picture of the 27 pound animal next to a smaller fox. He was lamping for his friend Graham, who he says shot it with a moderated Mossberg 410. Meanwhile, BBC TV presenter Chris Packham has accused the field sports community of spreading fear with giant fox stories. Writing on the website of the Fox Project, of which he is a patron, Packham says the reports should not be taken seriously because no independent verification exists. The UK record is this 38 pound one ounce fox shot by a farmer in Aberdeen. You are an up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. And there is more news on our website. Later in the show, we have Mike Powell on night vision and our news editor, Ben O'Rourke, goes up against the seagulls of Scarborough. Next up, the latest survey category to be scrutinized by our viewers is the sound moderator section. Here are the results. A massive three and a half thousand of you responded to our March 2020 survey about kit and be very quiet. 10% of those answered the section on rifle moderators, which are becoming increasingly popular throughout the world as countries lift their Hollywood inspired restrictions on what politicians call silencers. We asked you to rate your mods, giving them up to five stars for various attributes, and you tell us that. Norwegian moderator company ATEC has the best reputation for accuracy. Reflex Moderators, the maker of that old stalwart the T8, gets your vote for efficacy, how well it works. DPT wins for ease of maintenance and value for money, and it takes joint honours for customer service with Rimfire-only moderator brand SAK. The big prize is the most popular manufacturer, and there is a clear winner, streets ahead of the rest. In third place comes Finnish company Asa Utra, second goes to Swedish company Stalin, and the winner with more than 20% of the market of Field Sports Channel viewers is a British company, Wildcat. And I think Wildcat is the only UK manufacturer to win a category in our field tester survey results. As for your favourite moderator model, the top three are all for centrifires. In third place is the Reflex T8. Second goes to the Acer Utra Jet Z. I was impressed by viewer Phil from the UK who says he has the Acer Utra JZ. And the winner by another long chalk, it's the Wildcat Evolution. There you are, thinking of a new moderator by British. A slogan from 1968 originally promoted by the later disgraced newspaper proprietor Robert Maxwell. Bet you didn't know that. Now, this film and all our other surveys are available to view on our Field Tester YouTube channel and we'll have our September Field Tester show out this Friday. Presented by David, Jason and Tim, they gel test chronographs so you can pull apart the current shotgun shells that have eco or bio on their cases. Okay, so here's our three biodegradable steel shot wads. Also in the show, we ask an animal nutritionist what happens when you feed a dog vegan dog food. Dogs have evolved over thousands and thousands of years to primarily eat a meat diet. And our gun shot gurus give us the weight of their experience on spring as moderators trade-ins and sub £2,000 shotguns. Now, the aerial splatting machines known as seagulls are apparently on a risk list, says Natural England. The civil servants clearly haven't visited the seafront at Scarborough, where the council is handing out cash to slow the guano spread. Sunny Scarborough in North Yorkshire is one of the top tourist spots on England's east coast. Like some of the others, it's got a serious seagull problem. The seagulls are always coming trying to pinch the ice cream cornets and things like that. Dawn Jackson's shop is slap in the middle of the strip running along the seafront. 
An incident with an intruding herring gull left her scarred. We got into the corner by the ice cream, so I grabbed a tea towel, put it over his wings, and it was a lovely big seagull. And I, I'm looking at him, I'm holding him to put him back outside. And all of a sudden he turned around and bit me on my lip. <laughs> I've still got the scar. <laughs> As we reported earlier this year, Natural England insists seagull numbers have dropped to seriously low levels. If that's true, why does Scarborough Council say the problem is now so bad it's offering people cash to help gull-proof their buildings? It says it will pay half the cost, up to £2,000, of putting up nets, spikes and fire gel, a smelly substance birds hate. Nearby resort towns Whitby and Filey are doing the same. The pinch people's ice cream, fish and chips, council have asked us not to feed them, you know, so there is a lot of them. Our previous report on Natural England was about it denying falconer and pest controller Gary Baxter a permit to shoot gulls nesting on a factory's air conditioners, which creates a fire hazard. If there's one thing Gary dislikes more than gulls, it's gulls that land on his van, which has several raptors inside. If Kizzy knew what was above her head now, she would go bloody mental. You cheeky... I'll say it. Get off my van! Get up! Sling your hook! Once the birds of prey are out, the local gulls take to the air, unsettled by the strangers. That's got some activity. Now we're getting the idea. If I was you, I'd put your hood up. Because these guys might get a bit frisky. Within a few minutes, the gulls are gone, moving over to the bay where they stayed for the rest of the afternoon. The only gulls that stayed were the dead ones caught in netting on buildings along the seafront. Netting's not going to cure this problem. No amount of mileage of spiking or fire gel is going to cure this problem. All they're going to do is push the, push the problem somewhere else. How many, how many businesses are there up and down here today? I lost count. There is a lot of businesses here and that two grand a pop the sheer cost of it is going to be astronomical. It's obvious that these businesses do need help. Before long, it's going to start affecting their visiting trade. I've heard stories already today of seagulls attacking people. I think, I think a good hawking, a hawking session through here, and you'd be able to disperse most of these birds. But the real worry to me is the heritage side of it. Some of the buildings are 200 years old and regularly need blasting with high power water jets to clean off the bird mess. Well, you look down that frontage, they're all roughly the same sort of figure. That's a lot of history there, been being damaged, and that's not pretty. My solution to be, today, would be egg and nest removal, and we move the colonies further down the cliff. I mean, look, how many miles of cliff faces are down there, Ben? That's where they're supposed to be. They're not supposed to be whipping somebody's cod and chips. The council's actually had uh, quite a few ideas. One was actually that they'd smash the eggs in the nests, but uh, the nests, as you can imagine, somewhere on chimneys and everything, I think that was just dismissed because it was really impractical and, and very, uh, uh, well, they'd need an awful lot, of, they'd need an army of people to do it. Yeah. Cafe owner Ray Goddard doesn't think his building is in the grant zone. He supports the council's scheme, but doesn't like the idea of pest controllers shooting birds. You could poison them, but then you're going to end up with these dead bodies lying about. And it's the same with shooting. I mean, where are they going to land? And it's going to upset a lot of people, and we, there's been a tourist spot. Besides the, the bad publicity of bring, really, it's, it's, it's not really a very humane thing to do. What Ray doesn't know is pest controllers in town who use guns usually use air guns which don't damage buildings then pick up the birds they shoot. During our short interview, Ray has a brainwave. I, I wonder if we can get to uh, some kind of, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know uh, contraception pills? Yeah. Well, they only breed at the beginning of the spring. So if we could get, because they'll eat anything and they'll fight everything off to get at it. So what I was thinking about, I know it sounds daft, you smile at me. <laughs> But I'm thinking it's such a, we, we just need to get, I don't know, fish, bread, whatever, that has these contractive pills in, and they'd gulp it down. But the thing is then, that season, they wouldn't be able to breed, would they? We wouldn't have to do it all year round, just at the beginning. The idea isn't that daft. Since the 1950s in the US, it's been known that a drug called Nicarbazin, that keeps chickens healthy, was found to have an unexpected side effect, preventing eggs from being fertilised. In 2003, Eric Wolf developed a system that uses the drug to control pigeon populations. We call it planned pigeonhood. 
it's a contraceptive. So it's just like the pill. You got to take it daily. Uh, you set up an automatic feeder and train the birds to go to the feeder. They eat some, you know, a quantity of bait every day, and that's it. You know, you go out and kill a bunch of pigeons, trap shoot or poison, I don't care. Uh, they're going to breed back in a matter of weeks. You know, they just breed so quickly. Six clutches a year. You know, if you want to get down to the, to the cause of the problem, you got to stop the reproduction. Early on, Eric tried developing contraceptive feed that would bring down Canada geese numbers as the birds cause problems. We got a tremendous amount of pushback from the hunting community and from state agencies. So here in the United States, uh, the state agencies control much of the hunting bag limits, how many geese you can shoot, da 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 da. The last thing they want is less geese. They want more geese so they can sell more hunting licenses. We've never tested a bird where it didn't work. So the hypothesis, the conclusion, if you will, is that uh, it works in all avian species. You got to have feathers and lay an egg. What about gulls? I don't think there's any question. We don't have any data to support that, but you know, somebody has to, if somebody's interested, they got to take the bull by the horns and start testing. Scarborough Council declined an interview saying national media reports portrayed the scheme as extreme anti-girl, with some even using the term hooligans. Meanwhile, at least one local family business has come up with a way of getting some compensation for the pesky gull problem. This is my son's idea. He's a, he's a character. It's unique to us. We've got a seagull here and we've got a seagull rock. And it tastes lovely. Is it seagull flavoured? Uh, it's chicken flavoured. It's chicken and uh, salt flavoured. You can try it, it's lovely. Thank you, Ben. And he was able to bring back two sticks of seagull flavoured rock, which are going out as a poetry prize to the Field Sports Nation. If you want to know more about that, you can join them, F Channel slash Field Sports Nation. They are the happy gang of 600 of our top viewers who support our news features, which aim to change people's minds about hunting, shooting, and occasionally fishing. Thank you to all of them, and welcome this week to Andy Platt, who's joined the Field Sports Nation on Facebook, and to Paul Hennessy, David Martin Tenner, and Billy Bob, who joined on YouTube. Links in the description below. Now let's find out about night vision. Here's sporting rifle reviewer Mike Powell. Mike Powell is a professional fox shooter. He's made films with us in the past and he writes articles and reviews for shooting magazines including Sporting Rifle and Countryman's Weekly. He sees a lot of kit. Our night vision survey revealed that the PARD NV007 rifle scope attachment is the most popular night vision kit owned by Field Sports Channel viewers, followed by the ATN Excite 4K Pro rifle scope and the now discontinued Yukon Photon XT standalone rifle scope. That was in March 2020. It's a fast moving marketplace. Six months later, what does Mike think? The PARD isn't out of date, that's still going strong. I've got one, it's a very good bit of kit probably more suitable for rimfire 178 mr but it's for the price it's very good and certainly out to probably maximum of 125 150 yards is very good value for money and enables people to shoot to those ranges without too much problem simple to use the ATN X site has, I would think, probably fallen out of favour for a variety of reasons. Six months has gone and has been replaced by things such as the Wraith, which is a very good piece of kit from Sightmark. Mike's own choice for favourite night vision is none of these. I bought probably 15 years ago a Starlight Longbow, which in those days was a lot of money. I think it was about £4,000, which then was substantial. It's lasted me 15 years, still does the job, probably as well as anything else. Doesn't have the advantage of being able to use during the day, along with the archer. Although night vision and thermal kit can quickly look out of date as new launches take place, 
Mike says he would be happy to use a combination of the elderly Starlight Longbow and a shiny new Pulsar Accolade Thermal Spotter for the rest of his fox shooting career. For spotting, thermal is unbeatable. I mean, the Accolade... I was up, up on one of the hills here in Devon recently and I could see sheep. Now, I don't shoot sheep, but I could see them at a distance of several miles which is incredible. I probably would say that the Accolade would pick up a fox at certainly a mile and a half, possibly two miles. Pulsars, thermal spotters, whatever they are, be it any of the old ones, the Quantums, right up to the current Accolade, are very, very good. And they last well, which they should do for the money you're paying for them. Thank you, Mike. Filmed near his home in Devon. Now from the south coast to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Robin Foxer says this video is something a little different from his norm, also showing good use of the meat harvested in what he calls an episode of Inland Goose Mayhem. Alex Davidson gets in touch with us on Instagram with a non-shooting film. He's out after rabbits with four ferrets, two dogs, no guns and no nets. Stu from Australia's Hunting with Stu channel follows local game processor Dave as he talks through his kangaroo meat business, plus they head into the hills after big hogs. Corvid Hunt is helping out a friend on land where the rabbits are chomping through vegetables. He's using an Air Arms S510 Ultimate Sporter in 177 with an ATN X Sight 4K scope. Lloyd Patterson's kit review channel looks better and better. Here's his explainer on shooting glasses and a review of the Pillar Outlaw X7. Joey Parachin and for his Himalayan hunting series over the summer has launched a six part series of films about hunting in Africa. He sends me the first one, hunting Springbok and Hemsbok. He says, look out for episode five and how to make Springbok biryani. Viewer Jordan contacts me from Kenya with this, a film on the unusual fish of the river Una in the Balkans. If you like fishing, which Jordan and I do, it is a thing of beauty. And finally, a typical city view of a lovely piece of wilderness. The New Yorker magazine dispatches film director David McLean to visit the whale hunters of Greenland. It's painfully urban, but those city people do make pretty films. That's it for this week. I have put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the iSymbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link, Charlie at Field channel.tv Well, that is it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, find out how to win rock, don't let's forget. And we'll contact you about our show, Field Sports Britain. It's at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and from a COVID-aware countryside, goodbye. <laughs>